Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. You all know the story of Little Red Riding Hood, right? Little, go little girl goes to the, the forest to bring a basket full of goodies to her grandmother. But a wolf sees her and takes a shortcut to grandma's house, eats her, puts on her clothes, and waits for the girl to show up so he can ambush her. But then a guy with an axe shows up and kills the wolf. <laughs> well, today's garbage is Little Red Riding Hood, a no-budget movie from 2016 that you have never heard of, loosely based on the fairy tale. And by loosely, I mean not at all. Beyond there being a character who wears a red hood, this movie has next to nothing to do with the source material. What it does have to do with is actors in Halloween costumes silently walking around and not doing anything while annoying music covers up the fact that there's no sound design. Now here's the thing. When I talk about incredibly stupid movies like Dragon Ball Evolution, they at least aren't boring. And that's the worst thing a movie can be. I can sit through Dragon Ball Evolution because even though everything that happens is stupid, there are still things happening, and the plot keeps moving forward. Red Riding Hood is one of the most boring movies I've ever seen because virtually nothing happens. It's 8 minutes worth of story stretched out to 80 minutes. It's like watching my live subscriber count on Social Blade. Speaking of which, subscribe to my channel, like this video, leave a comment, and support me on Patreon. Anyway, let me, let me just explain what the experience of watching this movie is like. The movie starts off with a repetitive music loop made with a default strings VST in FL Studio, playing over a shot of what the movie wants us to believe is a medieval forest, even though it's obviously California. Get used to this music because it gets reused every five minutes to cover up the near complete lack of sound design. <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood, who is an adult in this version, walks through the woods and is spotted by a zombie knight. We cut back and forth between Red Riding Hood and the knight wandering through the woods for over a full minute before he finally catches up to her and warns her not to go that way. Do not go that way! It's at this point that we experience our first dialogue exchange in this movie's incredibly bad ADR. My grandmother is gravely ill. I must deliver this medicine to her. So of course Red Riding Hood runs away from the guy who's trying to warn her, and the knight takes off his helmet for no reason other than to re reveal his uh, rubber zombie mask to the audience, which we could already see. We then cut to some castle somewhere, and then a close-up of our villain, the Master. No, not that Master. This Master. The one with the finger sticking out of his head, which I think are supposed to be horns. He's not doing anything in this scene, so we cut back to Red Riding Hood continuing to run through the woods. But then we cut back to the Master doing nothing. Then we cut back to Red Riding Hood. Then we cut back to the Master. Then the Master have some, has some kind of psychic vision of Red Riding Hood. So then he cuts to the Master, then Red Riding Hood, then to the Master who gets up to look over a balcony of his castle, then back to Red Riding Hood, then back to the Master who finally goes to do something. We then spend the next three minutes just watching the Master slowly make his way down into his basement, where he keeps his werewolf. He then sp he spends the next minute or so just standing there looking at it. Then the werewolf goes running out from the castle. Then the Master opens the gate to his room full of stock sound effects. Then Red Riding Hood encounters the werewolf and runs away. Then we cut to the master walking up some stairs. Then we cut to the werewolf chasing Red Riding Hood. Then we cut to the master climbing up more stairs. Then we cut to the werewolf chasing Red Riding Hood. Are you starting to notice a pattern? So after about four minutes of this back and forth crap, Red Riding Hood finally reaches the castle and locks herself in to hide from the werewolf. Now are you starting to notice something? This movie has no pacing. We are now 15 minutes into this movie, and this is all that's happened. Red Riding Hood meets a knight who tells her not to go somewhere, but she goes anyway. The Master senses Red Riding Hood, and sends his werewolf to chase her to this castle. And that's it. We're 15 minutes in, and we've got two plot points checked off. Just to drive home how tedious these first 15 minutes are, let's compare it to some real movies. In the first 15 minutes of The Dark Knight, some thugs and clown masks conduct a bank heist. During the heist, the thugs kill each other one by one until there's only one left, who's revealed to be the Joker, who gets away. We then get a short montage revealing that Batman has all the criminals in town terrified, and the police have no idea who he is. Then multiple Batmans show up to stop a drug deal between Scarecrow and some guy, but it turns out these are just copycats, and the real Batman shows up to stop Scarecrow and the fake Batman. 
Then Batman meets up with Commissioner Gordon who tells him about the bank heist and the Joker. Then Batman talks to his butler, Alfred, and we get some exposition about Harvey Dent, the new district attorney, and Rachel Dawes, the woman Batman is in love with. We then see Harvey Dent prosecuting Sal Moroni, the mob boss. So in the first 15 minutes of The Dark Knight, we're introduced to the Joker, who is established as being both conniving and ruthless. We learn that Batman has significantly reduced crime in Gotham City, and the police are trying and failing to find out who he really is. We also learn that Scarecrow, the villain from the first movie, is still around but has been reduced to making drug deals with petty criminals, and Batman has inadvertently inspired other people to fight crime like him. We find out there's a new district attorney who's also a, a hero to the city, and that Batman has a crush on the guy's girlfriend. We learn everything we need to know about the characters in the setting, and the plot is already well underway. Let's look at another movie. Toy Story starts with a kid, Andy, playing pretend with his toys. We're introduced to the various toys, and we get the sense that Andy is obsessed with his favorite toy, Woody the Cowboy. We also learn that Andy's family is moving soon, so they're celebrating Andy's birthday early, and all the toys are worried about getting replaced by new toys except for Woody, who's confident he will always be Andy's favorite. When Andy's friends come into his room to play with his new toys, all the toys return to their places and play dead. Then Woody meets Andy's new favorite toy, Buzz Lightyear. So in the first 15 minutes of Toy Story, we're introduced to the toy characters, we establish that the toys in this universe are secretly alive and sentient, and that they have to prepare for the owner moving to a new house, and that they live in fear of being abandoned or replaced. We even get a sense of this movie's theme about friendship from the opening credits. Now, what do we learn in the first 15 minutes of Little Red Riding Hood? That Red Riding Hood is trying to deliver medicine to her grandmother, there are woods, people wander through the woods, and there's a monster in the castle who sends werewolves to chase them. That's it. That's all we get in the first 15 minutes. So why am I comparing this fantasy horror movie to a dark superhero movie and a children's animated movie? Because I want to show that what I'm talking about is true regardless of genre or tone. You need to have things happening in the first 15 minutes of your movie in order to engage the audience. Nobody wants to sit through f boring shots of nothing happening until you finally decide it's time to start the story a sixth of the way through the runtime. When there's nothing happening for the first 15 minutes, it just shows you have nothing to show. Very little actual information is being conveyed to the audience in the first 15 minutes of this movie. Instead, we get completely pointless shots of people walking. Here's a tip for aspiring filmmakers. If a character is in one place, and then they're in a different place in the next scene, we can assume they moved. You don't need to show every tedious second of the journey, because it's not useful information we need to understand the story. But there's so little going on in this movie that they, if they didn't show that, Red Riding Hood would have made it to the castle in two minutes. When a movie is as poorly paced as this, it makes me think they shot the movie and then realized it was only 30 minutes long, so instead of writing in more scenes of action and dialogue, they decide to use every alternate angle they got of people walking just to pad it out. And they still didn't manage to get it long enough because then they decide to throw in a completely pointless subplot. Speaking of which, after Red Riding Hood locks herself in the castle, we inexplicably cut to modern times where some woman is taking photos with her lens cap on. She then pulls out her phone and starts vlogging about her photographic adventure. And then even though the actress was clearly shouting to be heard above the sound of the wind, whoever did the ADR decided to record it at normal speaking volume. I have to thank all of you again because this would not have been possible without your help. Remember when I complained that the first 15 minutes of this movie don't tell us anything about the setting or characters? Well, now this movie has suddenly decided to dump a bunch of information about this character by having her say it to her phone, which is just about the laziest way to get information across, short of just using voiceover narration. But everything we learn about this character is completely pointless. She mentions her mom and her dad, and she, that she's carrying around a can of bear mace. Now, my normal functioning brain, which knows movie logic, expects these things to be setting up some kind of payoff. Maybe she will contact her parents, or she will go missing and they will come looking for her. Maybe she will use her bear mace to fight off some kind of monster, or come up with some creative use for it to get out of a sticky situation. None of that happens. Spoiler alert, she just wanders around the woods until one of the master's minions blows up her car, then she breaks into a mansion and hangs out until the master kills her. Oh, and this entire subplot is completely disconnected from the rest of the story. You might think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. It has literally nothing to do with Red Riding Hood and her situation. All of the scenes of this character were, quite literally, added for no reason other than to pad out the runtime. The only practical purpose it serves is that talking about it makes it easier for me to get this video to over 10 minutes so I can have a mid-roll ad. Alright, so, the modern times girl talks to her phone, wanders around the woods, and then her car blows up. 
the people who made this movie somehow managed to find a way to stretch one sentence worth of detail into ten minutes of screen time. All for the sake of a subplot that doesn't even matter. So now, 25 minutes in, we cut back to Red Riding Hood wandering around the castle looking to see if anybody's home. The master goes into the basement again and releases another minion. This one has no eyes and sees through an eyeball that he carries around in his hands like Agra from the Dark Crystal. He's not a very threatening villain when you think about it. I mean, he constantly has one hand occupied, so that right there limits his ability to fight. Why doesn't he just tape the eye to his head? And you could just throw sand at him. Even if you don't hit his eye, he, he would have to cover it up and hold it behind his back to protect it, and he wouldn't be able to see while he was doing that, so he would be basically helpless. I also like how he carries around the same rubber mace that I got from Spirit Halloween when I was making terrible home movies as a kid. Anyway, Red Riding Hood continues to wander around the castle until she bangs on the door to the rooftop patio where the master likes to hang out. And then he makes a stock footage CGI skull appear, so Red Riding Hood runs away and tries to leave the castle, but finds out there's some kind of magical force field trapping her in. By the way, all that stuff I just described in one paragraph is another 10 minutes. So now we're 35 minutes in. I hate to sound like a broken record, but I cannot stress enough just how little happens in this movie. Avery single little thing takes too long. It is painful to watch. And the lack of sound effects and constantly reused music only make it worse. You know what, let's, let's talk about the sound design. There isn't any. I'm convinced they shot the whole movie without a microphone because all the dialogue, as far as I can tell, is dubbed over in post. And there are only a handful of sound effects. You never hear footsteps, clo clothes ruffling, wind, or any kind of ambient noise. So, to cover up the lack of a soundscape, the movie just has constant music. But I guess they only had 10 minutes worth, because they play the same two or three tracks over and over again. And the visuals aren't any better. Forget about the special effects, just the camera work and editing is incompetent. Look at this. Did you see that? Was that the camera shaking as the camera guy pressed the button to stop recording? Were they really so desperate to get this to 81 minutes that they just had to use every last millisecond of that take? And if you're watching this in HD, you might have noticed the fake film scratches overlaid over the obviously digital video. It even says they shot it on a Blackmagic production camera in the credits. You're not fooling anyone, you pricks. And why don't you try color grading your footage? I mean, look at this. There's no atmosphere to this movie at all. The lighting is consistently flat, as if they just used whatever light was naturally available. Every time we see the spooky castle, it's shown in broad daylight. It, it just looks like a tourist attraction. I guess they spent all of their energy trying to frame the corn dog stands out of the shots, Otherwise, they could have digitally replaced the sky, darkened the footage, composited in some fog, and made it look like a movie, as opposed to a tax write-off that they slapped together over a weekend. <sighs> anyway, since Red Riding Hood can't leave, she goes back into the castle and meets a guy who says he's a prisoner like her, and explains that the master came from the lost city of Atlantis. He's from this world. He's one of the ancients. The rest of his kind drowned when the oceans swallowed Atlantis. Which is another detail that doesn't affect the story in any meaningful way. The guy also explains that the Master traps people so he can feed on their suffering until they die. I guess because that's what Atlanteans do. That explains the Aquaman movie. We then cut back to modern times, and the girl whose name I can't be bothered to remember runs up to a mansion and, again, she wanders around while the Master watches her through his psychic vision. Either that or he has a migraine. Then the music gets even worse. Eventually, she sits on the couch and starts vlogging again. And in a shot frame super wide like some kind of Buster Keaton comedy, the master comes out from a door behind her and walks past her to the stairs. It's a good thing there are any sound effects or she might have heard him. Wait, if she's vlogging with her phone and she's pointing the camera at herself, and the phone has a screen, shouldn't she be able to s you know, whatever. We cut back to the main <clears throat> story, where the master casts some kind of spell on another one of his minions. 
Then we're introduced to another character 47 minutes into an 81 minute movie. He sees a woman hanging up laundry in the middle of the woods, and instead of thinking about how weird and obviously suspicious this is, he goes up to her, and she uses her implants to lure him away. We cut back to the castle. Red Riding Hood is hanging out in a corridor when the eyeball guy reaches his hand through a window in an unintentionally hilarious moment. So then we start cutting back and forth between Red Riding Hood being chased by Eyeball Guy and the warrior dude following the lady to the castle. This goes on for five tedious minutes until Eyeball Guy catches up to Red Riding Hood and we see some kind of visual representation of the master absorbing her negative energy or something. But then the old guy shows up to rescue her, but then he dies immediately. <laughs> then the warrior guy follows the lady into the chapel where they start making out. But then her magical disguise comes off and reveals that she was the master's minion the whole time. As the warrior guy runs away, he sees Red Riding Hood running from Eyeball Guy and hits him with his sword. He then runs up to Red Riding Hood and starts talking in a voice that's obviously not the voice of the actor. What kind of place is this? He sounds like Duke. This place is ballin', yo. Chicken nuggets be crispy like you never seen. Then I'm leaving. And you should too. But they can't leave because there's a force field. So then they go into the basement for some reason, and Red Riding Hood tells Warrior Guy about how she was chased by a werewolf. She explains that if they kill the master, that will take down the force field. If you kill the lord of this castle, his magic dies with him, and we'll be free. How do you know that? So Red Riding Hood concocts a plan. Then we cut to modern day again, we see the girl wake up on the couch. She picks up her camera and realizes somebody was taking photos of her. Just picture that. Imagine the master dressed up in his medieval warlock outfit, taking photos with a digital camera. How does he even know how to use it? Then even though she realizes somebody else is in the house, instead of making a beeline for the exit, she decides to go investigate the sound of a baby crying. So after a shot of the master feeding on her suffering, she runs into a door and gets electrocuted. She never even found out where the baby noises were coming from. There wasn't even anything mimicking a baby. They just threw in the sound effect because they needed some reason for her to stay in the house. So the master walks up to her and she gets up and runs, but he catches her and I guess he sucks the life out of her and she just dies. And that's it. That's the end of that subplot. I told you it was pointless. Cut back to Red Riding Hood and Warrior Guy having a conversation about how scared they are until Red Riding Hood remembers where the Master hangs out. It's the only way. You will never hack through his doors, not with this. Well, of course not. It's a plastic Halloween prop. So for the big climax of our movie, Red Riding Hood's genius plan is for her to lure the Master out of his chamber, and then have Warrior Guy hit him with his sword. It's so stupidly simple that there's no way the Master could possibly be dumb enough to fall for it because he would have been killed years ago but then he falls for it. As the Master comes walking up to Red Riding Hood, Wario Guy comes up, and the Master starts shooting green lightning at him. Wario Guy tosses his sword to Red Riding Hood, who proceeds to swing the sword at the Master with all the strength and effectiveness of a fighter. She manages to kill the Master, then the magical barrier starts to disappear. Red Riding Hood and the Wario Guy walk out of the castle before it crumbles in a bad special effect. <laughs> Then we see Red Riding Hood's grandmother feeding her goats. I thought she was supposed to be sick. In any case, Red Riding Hood gives the medicine to her, and it seems like everything is alright. But then we cut to the master who's still alive, and then the movie abruptly ends. And then the same two songs we heard a thousand times throughout the movie play during the credits. So that's Little Red Riding Hood. I think the most poetic way to end this review is to just not have a concluding statement because I already put more effort into this review than they did into their screenplay. So like, comment, subscribe, and support me on Patreon. I'm done. Ten dollar patrons. Blandest. Charles J. Harris. Dickens. Keith Paul. Lex Reardon. Marco Schnipper. Paco. Tyler M. Wright. Victor Gontar. I haven't got any other ten dollar patrons since the last video. Ain't nobody supporting me. Got, got no, no emotional support in my life, got no financial support. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go lay down.